We are on chapter 13, The Generous Life. We do not have a PowerPoint, so you guys just have to look at me and I'll look at you. And, uh, <laughs> it's a very Jerry. pretty view. <laughs> Thank you. We got Jerry Rushfelt, Ryan Ballantyne, and Jeremy Baptist is here in person today. So there's at least six of them. Oh, Paul sneaking well, in. One, two, we got Paul ben. Oh, there's Paul. Maybe Paul can teach. Paul, oh, I forgot. Us. Did you <laughs> teach him today? Did you read the chapter? Yeah, lightly. All right, that's mm. not, that's what I did too. <laughs> well, we can. All right, between two teachers chit -chat. and Jerry the judge, we'll get this done. <laughs> so, on in chapter 13, I'm going to read the two scriptures. Remember that Tony likes to read. Um, he likes to have a. Old Testament scripture, a New Testament scripture, and then a Restoration script scripture at the end of his chapters. That's his mantra. So we're going to start with Psalm 145, verses 7 through 9. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. Paul, you want to read the second one? Um, for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And that is 2 Corinthians 8, verses 9. So our, our theme is the generous life, discipleship, is a journey into the lavish love of God. And I liked, I liked this quote at the bottom of page 99. At the center of our faith is God, the eternal community of persons called the Trinity. The one God is a dance of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the giver, the given, and the giving. So I really like that imagery there, the the, uh, the dance of the of the Trinity is kind of how I'm looking at it. So I guess my first question to all of you guys, and I'm actually going to use some of his questions here. Um, what does it mean to say that discipleship is birthed from the extravagant love of God? From those two scriptures and your own testimony and or your own reading. <laughs> what do you guys think to that question? Uh, restate it again. Okay. The question is, what does it mean to say that discipleship is birthed from the extravagant love of God? Jerry. Well, uh, I'm not sure if this exactly addresses what your question is, but okay. I can't help but well, you look at that statement in Psalm there, and how it describes the Lord. Uh, that is one of the most optimistic statements you can possibly find, and it comes right out of Scripture. Yeah. You read that and uh, you have to say, it's fortunate as people to have a God who is like that. And yeah. I know I've read or seen that song before, but I mean, when it's highlighted here, it kind of uh, comes out at you. Yeah. And uh, I just. It is. You know. You can say a lot about the scriptures, good and bad, but I don't think you can say it's sugar-coated. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Psalms, like you said, it's optimistic, but it's not ignorant because um, other Psalms are very, some would say pessimistic, but very emotionally honest. And then one of my favorite scriptures, although I don't know if I can quote it directly, is "Great, how great is your faithfulness steadfast love or, and it comes from the book of lamentations and i had never like delved into it until this year and you know lamentations the backdrop is very grim yeah 
Lamentations um, is like the opposite of positivism. But it has one of the most inspirational quotes ever that you could slap on a poster, you know. Um, so I like what you said there, Jerry. Um, uh, even though I, yeah, I, we're kind of circling the question a bit. But. We're getting there. We're well, getting I there. Think, you know when, you know when you come into discipleship, you are stating. Uh, by your act that you are willing to embrace the practice of love like God loved and that's difficult to do uh, you know he talks about love so costly but then he says the nature is to give itself away I see that love is so costly that it's going to result at times in our lives in great sorrow and you think about individuals that you have loved that have left this life and the sorrow that you experience because you love them and, and now they're not with us any longer. Mm -hmm. um, you think about scriptures like Psalms and Lamentations where they have kind of this negative um, tone that really when is, good. when you think about the scriptures, what Ryan was talking about, Lamentations and, and the sorrowful Psalms, um, your desire to, to be loving and to be like God uh, is, is being expressed in those scriptures in your sorrow because you failed, you, you fell short. Um, in, in that case, Israel fell short, the, 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 the people of God have fallen short and that's what Jeremiah was expressing, I think, in his scriptures and the psalmist sometimes expressed when, you know, they, they felt this tremendous sorrow for not having lived up to the, uh, their part of the commitment, their part of um, you know, the relationship with God that they had said that they would. So I think anytime you love and you love deeply, um, at some point there's a cost. <laughs> there, there will be a great cost. Now it would be easy to go through life and say, well, I just will never love because I don't want to experience those things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and we experience the loss of relationships, we experience the mm -hmm. loss of loved ones, we experience the loss of our own self uh, in worth and integrity when we don't do what we know we should do. Um, but now that, that doesn't have anything to, do, anything to do with generosity, but I think it calls us back to, to you know, a spirit of loving and, and giving. And, giving and, is certainly part of that. And that's, that's a good description of what extravagant love means. Yeah. You know, because Tony says extravagant love was, um, that's what Jesus demonstrated. And Jesus, of course, you know, there, that's the greatest sorrow of God that he puts his son on earth and they kill him. And I mean, that's, that's that sacrifice. And I do, think, mm -hmm. I do think extravagant love, like Paul is saying, does mean that the, you have to accept the joy and the sorrow together, yeah. even for even for people who are in your life. Yeah. You know, I mean, well, and, and Jesus did that. He Jesus did that. Says he looked at Jerusalem and wept and said, "You know mm -hmm. how I would have gathered you like a chick, uh, like a chicken gathers or a hen gathers the chickens under its wings." Yes. Uh, but you wouldn't have it. You know, you you yeah. turned your back. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. There's. Um, but, but, I mean, I experience it at work when, when my students don't live up to the quality of my expectations sometimes. I mean, we're all human, and it's not that I blame them, but yeah. um, sometimes they'll, you know, work loopholes and take mm. the easy way out. And I think, well, you know, you should have taken the high road and, yeah. and then done things this way. Uh, and I kind of grieve a little bit inside because I think, well, did I not teach them properly, or did I not set the example that I should have set? Yeah. And they deflunk them, you know, them, though. Well, I mean, sometimes they get unexpected, you know, not very good grades. Yeah. That happened. Yeah. I was gonna say <laughs> but we were that talking about that. Was but, it last but that doesn't week? make me feel better about it. No, you know, exactly. Give somebody a C or a D. <laughs> well, and that's a good teacher too, Paul. That you know, I mean, you're you're gonna be tough, but it, it's painful to yeah. you. Yeah, that they're not learning you know, you know? And with your children it's yeah certainly works yeah. that way sometimes if they choose a different path than what you yeah. maybe would have had for them well and you know i i keep thinking that there's i think it was somebody said in a sermon it, i i actually remember it was rick um shipley do you guys remember rick shipley uh -huh. he he gave a sermon one time here at mission road and has stuck with me all these years because he had left 
um, I don't know if he was fired or if he quit. That part of it doesn't matter, but he was very, very angry at his boss over it. And what he said was, forgiveness doesn't have anything to do with the other person. It has to do with you and your and how you live life. Mm -hmm. So I think of that often with friends and family and people who disappoint me, you know, my associates never do the job right, so I come in and do it for them, you know, because it, it just really irritates me. But extravagant love to me means that doesn't matter. I'm going to love yeah. them anyway. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. You know, God can keep going with all, us. I'll accept the sorrow. I'll accept exactly. the cost. Yes. You know, we, we may, I mean, it may be as simple as giving our tithes and offerings and we say, well, I'm not happy with the way the World Church, you know, is spending their money or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people were unhappy, you know, that we had this $130 million uh, retirement deficit that had built up. And they say, well, what happened? You know, I've, I've been giving my tithing and yeah. that's what you did with it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's that's the extravagant love part of it is that you're going to love in spite of the potential for hurt feelings, I guess, sometimes. Yeah. Back to the original question here. It just reminded me of the thing you learned in Sunday school as children. We love him because he first loved us. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I keep thinking of joy and sorrow. I've always, think, you know, I mean, Khalil Gibran said it in his beautiful book, The Prophet, where, where you can't have sorrow until you know joy, and you can't have joy until you know sorrow, because they're two different sides of the same thing there that's how you have relationships you know and uh at the at the funeral i went to um um mr howard harrington's funeral yesterday and uh what the person it was it was judge Byrne, david Byrne. it was the preacher and he said that when you come into the world you are crying and people feel joyful and when you leave the world, people are crying because of the joy you gave them in life. And so he said he was talking about that joy and sorrow. They're just they just balance each other out. That's what love is. So I really like that. All right, we did good answering that question. We did good. Off to a good start. Off to a good start. <laughs> Oh, Jerry's got more. Good. Well, let, me, let me just add something okay. because you, you, you're referring to the judiciary there and what can happen sometimes in terms of, you were talking about that earlier too. About the, uh, uh, when you're talking about what a judge has to do in a hearing, very often you're looking at something that you don't want to do. You don't like this particular requirement that is embedded in law and yet you do what you can to provide not only what is required but also uh, bring the best words of hope of uh, regeneration of possibility that goes beyond what is just a simple requirement of a statute uh, yeah. And you do that the best you can, and very often you say it doesn't make any difference anyway. Yeah. But it does say that in our institutions, there are, there's always a challenge, whether it be medicine or law or whatever. There is always a challenge to see not only what is the words themselves, but what beyond that uh, raises an opportunity or a requirement of how you're going to treat another person, another human being, or a group of human beings out there. And that's something that uh, can become a challenge every day of your life, depending on where you're actually spending it. And, but I still come back to the, what's here in the Psalms as the starting mm -hmm. point of a hope that we're not alone in what we do. Never we're not alone. We have a God. We have have the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, who can uh, minister to us under any circumstances and help us to make the best out of this particular situation. And and the the, the beautiful words words of that psalm say, 
and they shall, which is us, we shall sing aloud of your righteousness. I mean, that's what we do in church, probably better than anything else that we sing aloud. That's that joy that you're talking about of the righteousness. The, and, you know, the Lord is gracious and merciful and slow to anger. You know, and that's, that's a tough task sometimes. You know, I mean, this is a roadmap to what generosity means, you know, to actually try to be slow to anger. I do not always follow those rules, but I try, <laughs> you know, it's kind of all about the effort sometimes, isn't it? All right, let me ask question number two. How may we glimpse the generosity of God? And that would be in Christ, in our own lives, or just, um, how would you say, how do you glimpse the generosity of God? I like his comment about generosity being evident in creation. And he, I, I hadn't thought about this. He, he talks about the created order. There's a lot of giving and taking. And Jeremy knows as a biochemist a lot about that. Um, you know, you're thinking the human body, uh, a red blood cell at the end of its life, which is about 120 days, isn't mm -hmm. just removed from the body. It's actually broken down, recycled, and made into new stuff in our bodies yeah all the time yeah so so there's you know there's this, this giving of the of the heme molecule which is the iron part of the blood and it's recycled and reused and 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 it becomes a new blood cell at some point and i you know it, the, all of the molecular activity in, in the body and the cells and the creating of proteins and so forth you know there's there's giving of components and electrons and so forth to I mean, it's not generosity in the capacity, the way that we think about it, but it is, you know, there is giving in nature. So it is, it's a cycle it's of, a cycle. of death and new life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I did not know <laughs> we had that in our own bodies. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I thought that was, I thought that was neat for Tony to point that out. I mean, yes. you know, here, I, I never thought think about this stuff way. a lot, and I never would have come yeah. up with that. <laughs> I, uh, you know, you got a lot of, you get a lot of Facebook pop-up things, you know, yeah. and a friend of mine loves nature, and she put up a photo of a lung, and you, um, scientists will understand this better than me, a lung on one side, you know, an x-ray of a lung, or maybe it was an MRI, I don't know, of a lung, and then on the other side, a tree with the branches, and they were almost identical, <laughs> and I was looking at that going, oh, Except it's upside down in the lung. It's upside yeah. down, exactly. That's yeah. what it was. But the, the except the, when you're looking down. The <laughs> images, though. I mean, I was struck by how similar those images were, you know. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh, God's creation is it's kind of wild, you know. I mean, that I don't know if that it's purposeful or what. You know, I, I tend to believe that all of what God has done is purposeful. But maybe He is trying to teach us with our own bodies what creation means, what love means, what all of this means. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know. That's a, that's a cool concept for me. Anybody else? How may we glimpse the generosity of God? Well, I think there's this notion and especially in Christianity, but in other faith journeys as well, uh, of being the hands of God, you know, it's being the ones responsible for carrying out God's will with respect to our relationship with each other and, and helping. I mean, God created us with lots of capacity to help each other. Yeah. Think of, I don't know who it is, talks about the angels in life maybe it was i don't know anyway you talk about angels and, and many people say well so and so came and brought me a meal you're an angel yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know it's angel is god's messenger so yeah kind of kind of that thing i guess is what i'm thinking and i also think of the, the widow who gave her last coin mm -hmm. you know i mean you know tony does talk a little bit about even churches that are poor 
you know, they, they try to figure out a way to be generous to others, you know, to the, uh, to the impoverished. So matter, no matter how, you know, it might be hard for us, it's still, I think it's part of who God is to, to learn how to be generous in nature, you know? Yeah. Don't wait until you made it rich to be generous. Right. You know, your income is 20, 20 grand a year. And you're like, well, I'll be generous once I get to 40 grand a year. Right. And then you get to 80 grand. Yeah. And you're like, well, yeah. I can be a little bit generous, but I'll wait till 100 grand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it needs to be part of you right. from the very beginning mm. of your life, you know. Yeah. And, and our church has been good about teaching stewardship and, and what that means. We all have varying degrees of, of learning that lesson, but I, I always have liked the the theme of what stewardship means it, to to you know really balance your life with your talent your treasure and your time your time talent treasure and a third one <laughs> i'm talent <telling> treasure okay <laughs> and your time so that's what generosity talent is. talent time treasure yeah okay so how did the, oh, we were kind of talking about this just now, how did the early Christians practice generosity in the communities? You know, especially when you think about, you know, I mean, Paul was talking about it in, 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 in the scriptures, but in our own church, you know, when we've talked about the gathering before and kind of what that meant to people, there was a lot of poverty in America when, mm -hmm. when our church started. And so... It's interesting to me that that was part of the message. Especially with the Irish coming over. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and so, you know, to kind of open them, it, 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 I think it caused strife eventually, you know, because it's hard for people to share when they don't have much to share. It is hard. But the church said, you know, this whole kind of the, the, the storehouse type of a thing and the, and the way that we're all going to share in community was pretty brave back then, you know. But the Petrian church, they took everything in common, so they gave everything to the church. And the right, church. right. Well, we saw, we saw in the early Christian church how that was a bit of a problem, you know, meaning, right. I mean, you yeah. know, giving, giving your land or something to the priest got you into heaven better or something, you know, and there's a danger. Yeah, in that. we take good things and make a mess of them, don't we? We really do. <laughs> <laughs> I think in, no matter what time it is, what time frame, what era we are in, we... I think maybe in the early Jerusalem church it probably worked because probably most of those people were poor, so, you know, they, they shared equally because they were all equally impoverished. Uh, I, I think as the church, as Christianity expanded out into into the Gentile nations where wealthy members were, you know, were, were coming into communion with, with Paul and, and his disciples. Yeah. Um, I think Paul that's where it may that. be. What's that? Paul didn't do that. It's Peter. Church. Well, as you say, they went, Paul went into the wealthier things and they didn't. Give all the, yeah, know, that's what I'm saying. I think you know when you when you when you have a disparity in in terms of wealth, then it becomes difficult for some to say, well, I, you know, I'm I'm at the hundred thousand dollar level. It's hard hard for me to, you know, give equally to somebody at the twenty thousand dollar level. Percentage wise. Percentage wise. Yeah. 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 Well, kind of jumping on the pole saying well um, when I was a kid I can remember people talking about stewardship in our church and uh, it was always you pay tithing is one tenth of your surplus well I grew up in the uh, 30s in the depression years and by thinking of stewardship in terms of uh, you know, you just erased yourself out of any duty to give because the income's so much. 
always done for uh, so-called necessary wants. And so you can easily get into a mode where you're saying, you know, stewardship, that's something for somebody else. And that's something for somebody who only of one. And I used to remember I used to think about that occasionally you know, from someone I knew well, just who is able to do it. And as far as I was concerned, stewardship was something that applied to wealthy people, you know, they could uh, pay tithing. And then came along in 1966 or whatever it was, the whole new scripture about stewardship in the Revelation by Wallace W. Smith. It was a whole new statement. Stewardship, didn't say anything about money. Stewardship is the response of my people to the ministry of my son. And is required alike of all those who seek to build Zion or build the kingdom or something to that end. And I remember when we were reading that, when it came out, and so we were reading, that was an idea that never occurred to me. I'd never seen stewardship and saving something to the stewardship and responsive people to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Not just something that you just treat as something that has a particular meaning in the world, but kind of the, the revelation of faith just this is part of what you consider in all the decisions of life that you so when you read it there was no sense of condemnation it was an invitation to grow and to grow in your understanding grow in your understanding and uh, so that's become a favorite scripture to me because I learned something that had never occurred to me before. Yeah, it used to be that there was, the church was picky, picky, picky about giving money and that sort of stuff. You had to fill out stewardship statements and all this sort of stuff. And then there was so many things that were indeterminate. I know in my case, I have. I didn't give up much until I don't know when it was, 1980s, because uh, I had a conflict with my my parent, my father, gave each of his kids a substantial amount of of stock, supposedly, in. Uh, was in Mary Mills, that was his company. And this was like $25,000, I think it was, which is substantial back then, in the 1960s in particular. And, uh, but it wasn't worth anything. And it never turned out to be worth anything. Absolutely zero. And so was I supposed to tie this or not? According to the church, I was supposed to tie it. I didn't see that, still don't see it. So, um, anyway, uh, I think the, uh, the somewhat, you might call it sloppier definition nowadays, <laughs> as far as money is concerned, is, uh, is, a, is more palatable and probably easier to, to, uh, to fathom. It's a broader yeah. definition yeah. now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, and stewardship really isn't a concept in, in other churches very much. There's a, there, I have talked with other Christian friends and start, you know, just kind of, I just talk about stewardship normal like we all do. And, and, and this person says to me, well, stewardship, I'm not sure how much the word is used in the Bible, but it's not empathized as much in other religions as ours, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I think you're right. I think it's the way that it has developed. I mean, you think about what Jerry's talking about, and then what Russ is talking about, how it's evolved. Our yeah. definition of stewardship has evolved. But there's always, and this is kind of Tony's point, there's always something in it that says, you know, there's a, there's a generosity component in there, you know, which I think is, is what Tony's trying to emphasize for us. You know, Jane? How do we do that? Yes, Arlene. Um, 
there are some religions where they tell you how much you owe and you're expected to pay that. And, you know, so it's not always, you know, totally voluntary. Uh, sometimes that's, it's kind of mandated by some religions. Yeah, yeah, that's, tr that's tricky to have that mandate. I'd say that also um, the, the, the spirit of generosity is not unique to Christians. That's true, that's a good point. <laughs> I mean that's 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 Jewish and that's that's even Muslim. Yeah. Sure. And I don't know about some of the other things, but uh, American Indian mm -hmm. religions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. We had uh, friends of Bernice here, and they were talking about uh, giving things at at uh, powwows and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. Basically, I, I said uh, the stewardship is like this, except with you're, you're giving things like that is sort of like ours, except without the accounting. Uh, uh -huh. But oh, that's that was, accounting was very important. Yeah. I think that was difficult for a lot of the Native Americans, the concept of owning land. Mm -hmm. You know, the, yeah. we, the, the white man came in and parceled up the land and you, you know, for a certain amount of money, you could get a deed and claiming that you owned this acre or two acres or whatever it was. And uh, the Native Americans just could, they couldn't yeah. grasp that. The, the land to them was just there for everybody. Um, and it was a gift of, yeah. of God or the gods or nature. Um, and, you know, it was, was meant to be used, but not owned. Right. Yeah. Historical perspective. This had nothing to do with Bernice. This had to do with our daughter Ruth, who was dating an Indian at the time. <laughs> I am I am reminded as you're talking, Ross, um, towards the end of her life, Joan Strom Miller had a Native American ceremony for several people, yeah. and she and she had I don't know if you guys remember that she had like four huge tables of things that she just wanted to give us, of, you know, that were personal to her, but also she said to us, wander around through the tables and decide for yourself what is personal to you that will remind you of me. It was, it was such oh. a spiritual <clears throat> ceremony. And I have, I have this, this box of hers in my bedroom still, you know, and it, it, it just feels like, that's the generosity of Joan, of, you know, that's what she, that kind of symbolizes who she was to me and what she did at the end of her life. That was a very Native American giving type of ceremony. You know? It kind of reminds me of what he says at the bottom of page 102. He says, giving of money, time, and personal gifts and our life's resources is a spiritual practice. And that's vital and important as prayer or participating in the sacraments. And that, you know, thinking of giving as a spiritual practice, yeah. that, that's very Joan. <laughs> it is, it is. And, you know, and I do think, you know, that that spirit of sacrifice is there, but, but also just, just how, what your mindset is. In, in fact, the next question is about the heart. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship of the human heart to generosity? So we can talk all we want about, here's the rules of stewardship, here's what we're supposed to do, but it's really the heart that makes a person generous, you know, it's, it's, so his yeah. question is. That's what people thought, it's really the brain. <laughs> that's, that's what Mr. Mr. Scientist, um, but your heart, okay. I, but, well, I, so it used to be that people believed that the center of, of human existence was the heart. Yes. They, they didn't understand it. keeps us alive. Well, know. but you can yeah. replace a heart. It does. Yeah. Yeah, that is, the, I mean, I, I get what you mean. You can replace a heart, but you can't replace a brain. Yeah, but the, the brain, you know, love, 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 and all of those emotions are, those are mediated by all the neurochemicals. That did, are did, anybody read, <laughs> did anybody read Norman Bernauer's book? I did. The Brain Transplant. Yes, brain I transplant. did. 
<laughs> didn't, didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, that was a big thing in his book. But we always, I know we do talk about giving from the heart. Yeah, we talk it's about the it symbol. As if that's the center of the soul or the center of, of yeah. human existence. Yeah, it's the symbol. Yeah. Symbolically, it's symbolic. Yeah, you, you can like, you know, you can write your check and have a, you know, a, a basically a, you know, bitter heart about it. Yeah. That's not, that's not what generosity means. You know, it's like begrudgingly, I'm going to write this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, begrudgingly, that you can be bitter. About. <laughs> it's not out of love to the IRS. Exactly. <laughs> that one's a little trickier. Am I generous <laughs> giving my money back to the government? You know, it's like, don't they take blood anyway? Yeah. <laughs> well, Paul, Paul yeah. is when you donate blood, is that giving from the heart? That's giving from your circulatory system. <laughs> <laughs> you, want to be, you want to be specific? Your heart pumps it out. Your heart pumps it out. That's <laughs> the right. Heart, the heart is just the pump. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to get like medically technical here about it. <laughs> so, so much for distraction. But yeah. obviously, <laughs> it's the it's the symbolism of the heart that that Tony is talking about. His his comment is the heart symbolizes what we focus on, and the good news of the reign of God invites us to have hearts undividedly centered on the beauty of God. On the beauty of God, so that kind of brings us back to the creation issue too you know i mean when, if you want to look at the creation as god's generosity you know we've talked about this multiple times in in this class and other places that you can go anywhere in the world and see the beauty of god you know and it's like there's such awe sometimes and and, and power in what the creation of god is so that's god saying this is how this is what I gave to you, kind of a thing. It's pretty cool. So finally, how do we practice generosity in Christian community? What is it that maybe we can do as at Mission Road or in our individual lives? How do we practice generosity? Well, there's always the oblation sign, <laughs> which is kind of limited. In what way? Well, it's not <laughs> limitless. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. Or they, she, she, there, there's some sort of a limit is what they'll give you, I guess. There it is. Well, I think the philosophy is that they would like to help as many people as possible with a reasonable gift rather than giving all of the money to the needs of one person. Yeah. You know, it's that's that's just a practical makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's just a practical decision that the church made. You know. Probably a number of factors that go into that. You're talking about uh, the overall possibility of how much can be uh, can be assembled for donation, who the people are, who dependable they are to continue to fund something. Uh, and all the things that that they have the responsibility of being stewards for the patients that you and I aren't thinking about. It's well, it's also just how much money is available. Right. You know, uh, not really a lot. Yeah. My, my dad worked for a short period for the church, and he was in charge of the oblation. And he used to say to me that, you know, there just isn't enough to go around. Yeah. You're thinking of the world and the people who need help. I mean, that's why generosity is important right here. And I do think Mission Road has been very generous. I think that that is part of what we want to be at Mission Road. I mean, the way we yeah. give not you only might, our money. You might but not know all of it. I know. I know. <laughs> I, know I, some I, things, I know some things that it's like there's some ge generosity just by individual people. Yeah. Where it just, I hear about it later and it just shocks me, you know, how, how much some of our people give. You know, they give their homes. They give, you know. I can remember going on home visits with Charlie Souter in, in Paw Valley District, who was our bishop, and, and people, you know, would request oblation funds to get through a rough time. And I can think about his explanations of it. He said, we can help 
enough to keep, he would say, keep the wolf away from the door for a month or two. Yeah. But, you know, you're going to have to make some changes in your life. You know, some things are going to have to happen to get you beyond that because the church is not capable of providing social security for you for the rest of your life. Did that in a very loving way, but mm -hmm. it made people know that we can help meet the immediate problem, but long term, you know, we got to think through this and, um, you know, it maybe it means applying for unemployment or it means, mm -hmm. you know, looking for other sources of support for a period of time that, that are available and maybe just, you know, a lot of times people just don't know what's available. That's, you know, social workers do a lot of that. Yep. And yep. so, you know, we have patients at the hospital uh, that have, I, I don't know how I'm going to go home and support myself with this illness that's going to take me 12 weeks to, to get better. And so they'll bring in social work and those people are phenomenal. They, mm -hmm. they know so many I know the resources. things, the resources that yes. are available to help yes. people. But if you never put the two of them together, then that wouldn't happen. Yeah. Even Googling, it's hard to find yeah. it, you know, but you're right. That's a, that's a great part of a social worker. It's job. just like, you know, you have a hurricane in Florida and people come down there to meet the immediate needs. You know, there's linemen that are going to fix the electricity and there are people coming with bottled water and, um, I forget the name of that retired chef that's got an organization now that he responds to. You know who I'm talking about? He, uh, he's got kind of an accent, but he responds to um, situations like earthquakes and hurricanes and things like that. And his professional team mm -hmm. makes thousands of meals that you know, or they, they will distribute, and it's all supported by donations that come into his um, charity. Uh, he, he's, you know, he's kind of given up being a professional chef in order to do this as his life's work now. Ah. And so wherever there's a disaster, this guy shows up and mm -hmm. starts making box lunches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's other things that, that people in this congregation have done that have, that have helped out individuals, but people's donating of their time and effort, basically. Yeah. My mother used to, I, I can remember when one of our members in Leavenworth who had been employed um, just lost his job. He was laid off and it's the first time in his life that he ever didn't have an income. He was a very responsible person, but uh, my mother went out to the commissary, which is the grocery store at the base at Fort Leavenworth and filled up her trunk full of groceries and took it over and said, here, this will help get you through until you find work again. When I think of generosity too, I, you know, the COVID experience comes to mind for me because um, you know, so many people lost their jobs and, you know, you had, you had the government funds over here, which were, some people had a hard time accessing. And I know people who were landlords who said to their tenants, this, is, this really surprised me that they said to their tenants, you don't have to pay for a while, mm -hmm. you know, and so it just, it was kind of a test in my mind mm -hmm. of some people's generosity because there was so widespread people losing their jobs and not, not figuring out how to make money, you know. And uh, I mean, there, there's tests for every day for yeah. us. We do, we do have generous people, don't we? <laughs> yeah. And it is a daily and hourly and minute by minute thing. Yeah. Um, I think in the early church, they really emphasized charity. And today charity is a cheap word, but back then it was, you know, it was love and outpouring of your faith into almost everything you did, said or did. Am I being charitable in what I say? Am I being charitable in how I handle the situations? I like that, yeah. Charitable. Yeah. It's a good word when you think of it in a broad sense like that. Right. Yeah. Here's, here's what um, Tony said. We show that generosity is the spirit of the Christian life by practicing the disciplines of tithing and justice making and by nurturing attitudes of compassion toward those in need. So he included justice making in, in that. that that's, a, that's a kind of a prevalent theme right now in our church of what does it mean to, for peace and justice? You know, are we a peace and justice church? You know, and so I do think that that's another state of mind for people to have. Uh, let me go ahead and end with his, his final 
scripture, and this isn't the scripture, I don't think it's the scripture you were talking about. This, because this is later, 165. Is that, is that, that's too late for W. Wallace Smith, I think. But it's similar when you were, when you were talking about it, Jerry. Doctrine and Covenants 165. What page are you on? It's, a, it's a page 104. Okay. Stewardship as response to the ministry of Christ is more than individual giving. It includes the generosity of congregations and jurisdictions that give to worldwide ministries of the church to strengthen community in Christ in all nations. Sharing for the common good is the spirit of Zion. We've got a lot of plaques out there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Dorothy spearheads that, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of community, outreach, international. outreach international giving and we I, 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 I picture it as we're, we're helping communities buy goats, you know, so yeah. that they can help themselves, which I think is, is once again a very generous spirit that we have. So, all right. Sorry I didn't have PowerPoint, you guys. I kind of blew it. <laughs> but we did all right. We did all right in our class.